Welcome back to my switched door light project. In this video, I'm going to be assembling and testing the board. The method I'm using to solder the service mount components is called reflow soldering, and it makes use of solder paste and a hot air rework station. In this technique, instead of directly heating each pad with a soldering iron and applying solder, the solder is applied in a paste which is just a mix of flux and tiny balls of solder. You'll be able to see the paste up close later in this video when I'm placing components. Once the solder paste is applied and the parts are placed, all you need to do is carefully heat the board to melt the solder. There are specialized ovens that do this, and you can build them for yourself from a toaster oven and some added components, but I'm going to just use a hot air rework station to heat the solder. I've found that it's fairly easy and I haven't run into any problems doing it this way. This is actually the first time I've ever ordered or used a solder stencil for a home project. I got it because I'm using a really tiny package for all the flip-flops, and I wanted to be sure to apply the right amount of solder to them to avoid any issues. Unfortunately, my camera couldn't focus properly with the reflective surface of the solder stencil, so I apologize for the blurry footage here. This stencil didn't require any special work from me to create, I just had to request it. It cost me about $20 total to order five boards and the stencil from JLCPCB. I ended up getting them delivered to me 23 days after I ordered them. Here I'm just comparing the board to the solder stencil to get them oriented correctly. This is the solder paste that I'll be using. There's nothing really special about it, it just happens to be what I bought many years ago when I did my first surface mount project, and I still have quite a bit left in the tube. In order to make sure the stencil doesn't flex and separate from the board while I'm applying the solder paste, I added more boards of the same thickness around the one I'm working on. You can tape these down to make sure they don't move while you're working, but since I'm working on such a small board, I decided to just hold the stencil in place. To line up the stencil, I first place it where I thought it should be, and then I made minor adjustments until all I could see through the holes were the solder pads. It's pretty easy to tell with your eyes, but the camera really doesn't catch it very well. In particular, I wanted to make sure that all the flip-flops were all aligned, so I was watching those more carefully than the larger components. Once it was all lined up, I used one hand to hold the stencil down while I used the other to apply some solder paste. Technically, you could just put a blob down and then wipe it over the stencil, but I felt like applying some to each component gave me a good idea of how much I needed to place total. I used an expired laminated parking card to spread the solder paste, which worked out pretty well. Removing the stencil carefully, you can see that the solder is applied nicely to the board. You'll be able to get a better view under the microscope though. As I place components on the board, I don't need them to be perfectly aligned because the solder will help align them when it melts. I'm placing them with fine tip tweezers and nudging them into place very carefully. It may look like there's going to be a solder bridge between RFRQ and C3, but that paste will glob to the nearest pad when it melts. That's one of the nice things about doing reflow soldering, you don't have to be all that precise with your solder paste. In the past, I've just put globs of solder where a part is going to be and allowed it to wick to the correct pads. I found that using reflow soldering is a lot easier with tiny components like this. You can get a fine tip soldering iron and solder them down one by one, but it can be a real challenge getting heat to wick properly with such a small contact area, and it can be hard to get the right amount of solder on each joint. It's not too bad with the bigger resistors and capacitors, but it's definitely difficult with the small pitch leaded packages, and can be impossible with no lead packages. The dual Schmidt trigger inverter gave me some trouble when I tried to place it. I left this in the video because I'm sure everyone has these same kind of issues. Just drop the device onto the board a few times and it'll turn right side up again. Sometimes soldering just takes some patience. I eventually got it into place.
The D flip-flops were more challenging than the other components to place, mostly because of the very small size and pin spacing, but you can see that I got them all in place fairly easily. Although you can't see anything on camera here, I am heating up the board to 200 C. I eventually bumped up the temperature to 260 C and you can see the solder start melting. I really should have gone up to 300 C and it would have sped up this process significantly, but I decided to keep it here since it was working and I wasn't in a big hurry. This video is sped up 8 times, so soldering the board actually took about 15 minutes, although you're seeing it in only 2. Also, you can see that I put another board underneath this one to protect my microscope. It probably would have been fine, but I just wanted to be extra cautious. After I was done with all the reflow soldering, I added in all the through-hole components off-camera. It's always neat to see the solder melt just from the hot air. It's almost like magic. You can see components move around a little bit and reseat themselves when all the solder under them is melted, especially the tiny packages. A helpful tip I learned a while back is if you're not going to be using a stencil, you can warm up the board a little bit before you place the solder paste down. That'll make it flow a little easier and make it stick to the board much better. A cold board and cold solder paste won't want to stick to each other, at least in my experience. It's a little different with the solder stencil as the pressure of squeegeeing the solder gets it to stick just fine without any warming. Another advantage of using a hot air gun to do soldering is that any plane of copper will be heated up fairly easily. Soldering irons only apply heat to a small area, so it can be a real bear sometimes to solder with a large plane of copper connected to a pad. And here's the final product. The board came out looking pretty good. On the back there's just the battery holder. I expect that one AAA battery will last quite a long time, but I haven't done any real testing yet to see how well this thing performs. The blue wires are going to my LED. You can see the limiting resistor in series with the LED here. The other wires go to the switch. This is going to be mounted with double-sided tape in a position where my cabinet will hold it shut when the door is closed. When the door is open, the LED turns on. The switch just acts as an on-off anytime the door is opened or closed. However, the timer resets and starts running every time the LED is turned on. I decided to speed this up quite a bit so you don't have to wait the full 30 seconds to see it turn off again. That completes the functional test. It's working exactly how I'd expect, so I'm going to go ahead and install it. I'll probably connect up another one of these for testing, leaving out the timer circuit so I can check out the performance of the boost converter in a bit more detail. Thanks for watching.